Welcome to this video on multiplexing and computer networks. Let's start. Okay. So what is bandwidth? Now see, bandwidth is the maximum rate of data transfer across a given path. And what would be bandwidth utilization? The bandwidth utilization refers to the wise use of available bandwidth to achieve specific goals. Now here wise, the word wise depends on the application you're referring to. And what is a link? A link you'll in uh, throughout this lecture, you will come across two terms being used a lot. One is link and the other is channel. Keep in mind that a link refers to your transmission medium, which can be either wired or wireless. And what you do is in multiplexing, you take a link and you divide it into n number of logical channels. Why do you divide it into n number of logical channels? Because what happens is the capacity of a transmission medium is often way too large to accommodate only one transmission. So if you're using a transmission medium, let's say you're using an optical fiber cable only for your purpose, what will you be doing? You will be in a, in a sense wasting most of the bandwidth of the optical fiber. So what is advisable is in you go for multiplexing, you take the optical fiber cable and you divide it into n number of channels and you take each channel and allocate it to an input device. So what you will have is if you have 10 input devices, you will divide your transmission medium, which in this case, I'm talking about an optical fiber. You divide it into 10 logical channels and you give it and you give each channel to a input device. So in this way, what happens is you maximize the use of your transmission medium. That is the main goal of multiplexing. Okay. Just keep this, these two points in mind that a link refers to a transmission medium and a link is divided into logical number of channels n number of logical channels. Now the question is when can we share a link, right? So whenever the bandwidth of a medium, like I mentioned just now, that whenever the bandwidth of a medium linking two devices here, two devices refers to your sending device and your receiving device. So whenever the bandwidth of a medium linking two devices is greater than the bandwidth needs of the individual devices. That means the bandwidth needs of the sender and the receiver. When it's greater, the link can be shared. And this is where multiplexing comes in. So you share your link using multiplexing techniques. And now the question is, what is multiplexing? So multiplexing is the set of techniques that allows the simultaneous transmission of multiple signals across a single data link. If the bandwidth of a link is greater than the bandwidth needs of the connected devices, the bandwidth is wasted. Like I mentioned that if you have an optical fiber, its bandwidth is fairly large. And if you're using it only for one transmission, that means transmission from one sending device to another receiving device, you're in effect wasting most of the bandwidth. So it's better to not waste the bandwidth and instead go for multiplexing techniques. And remember, there are three types of multiplexing techniques that we will be dealing with in this lecture. The first one is frequency division multiplexing, as you can see in point number eight, in short, written as FDM. Next is time division multiplexing or TDM. And the last one is wavelength division multiplexing. Now let's look at this diagram and try to understand the concept of multiplexing. See the word link refers to the physical path. Here you can see in the figure, there is one link and there are N channels. There is a link and it is divided into N number of logical channels. The word channel refers to a portion of a link that carries a transmission between a given pair of lines and one link remember can have N channels. So here I have N channels. Why, why do I have N channels? Because I have N input lines. So each input line will be allocated one channel and using that channel, the transmission from a particular input line will go to the particular output line. So see what happens is all these input lines will be transmitting signals of their own. Now the multiplexer will combine all the input signals into one composite signal and transmit it through this transmission medium transmitted through this link. Although this link will be considered as divided into n number of logical channels. In effect, the multiplexer will be converting n number of signals into one composite signal and giving it to the demultiplexer. Now, what will the demultiplexer do? The demultiplexer, which is sitting at the receiving end, will take these n number of n number of signals, n number of signals combined into one composite signal. It will take the composite signal and it will again break it down into n number of output signals and those output signals will be transmitted across each output line. Now, if we go to the next slide here, we'll discuss what is FDM. Okay. See the multiplexing techniques that we will be coming across 
is mainly categorized into two classes. One is analog technique and the other is digital technique. FDM is an analog multiplexing technique that can be applied when the bandwidth of a link is greater than the combined bandwidth of the signals to be transmitted. In FDM, signals generated by each sending device modulate different carrier frequencies. You'll see what are carrier frequencies shortly. These modulated signals are then combined into a single composite signal that can be transported by the link. Like you saw in the previous diagram, I was saying that the multiplexer will combine all the signals from each of these input lines and convert it into a composite signal and then transmit the composite signal across this link. So here FDM, what it will do is it will take the signals generated by each sending device, modulate the different carrier frequencies, and then these modulated signals are combined into one composite signal that can be transported by the link. Now carrier frequencies, mind you, are separated by sufficient bandwidth to accommodate the modulated signal. And remember, channels can be separated by strips of unused bandwidths, and these unused bandwidths are called guard bands. These guard bands are used to prevent signals from overlapping. In addition, carrier frequencies must be chosen in such a way that they do not interfere with the original data frequency. Now the question is, although FDM is an analog multiplexing technique, can we use it to transmit digital signals? The answer is yes. What you do is you take your digital signal and you convert it into analog signal and then carry out the transmission process. And multiplexing, which is carried out at the sender side and demultiplexing, which is carried out at the receiver side, takes a shape such as this. See, this is the multiplexing part in FDM. See, I'll try to explain each of these components. What you see here are three baseband signals. This is baseband signal one, right at the top. You can see here the baseband signal one. This is the baseband signal two, and this is the last baseband analog signal. So what is a baseband analog signal? Remember, a baseband analog signal is the original signal which has not been modulated. Any signal, which is original in frequency and has not undergone any modulation whatsoever is called a baseband signal. And here we are dealing with baseband analog signals. So what you do is you take each of your baseband signals and you give it to a modulator. Now, what will the modulator contain? The modulator here, we have three modulators as you can see through each rectangular boxes. Now each modulator will have carrier frequencies denoted as F1, F2 and F3. Now, what are these carrier frequencies? These carrier frequencies will help to take your baseband analog signals and transmit them over long distances. See, if you're transmitting a signal, an analog signal, it will generally be of, yeah, it, it will be of a fairly high bandwidth, of a fairly high frequency, but for long distance communication, what you, what you need to do is, you need to take this analog signal, this unmodulated baseband analog signal, and you need to pass it through a modulator. Now this modulator will contain a carrier frequency. Now this carrier frequency will be combined with your baseband analog signal and will generate a modulated signal. Now this modulated signal will be greater in intensity and as a result will be able to traverse longer distances. That's why we take the original baseband signals and give it to the respective modulators. And each modulator uses carrier frequencies of different frequencies denoted by F1, F2, and F3, as you can see in the figure. Now, after undergoing the modulation, the baseband analog signals take a different shape. As you can see, the frequencies have increased. See, here in the first case, in the first case, the baseband analog signal has a particular frequency, as you can see. Now here, after modulation, after coming out of the modulation, after being combined with the carrier frequency F1, you get a different signal altogether. Now this signal is greater in intensity and can travel longer distances. So like this, you have three modulators. Each modulator will generate a different modulated signal. Now these modulated signals will be combined. This plus symbol that you see here, this is your multiplexer these modulated signals will be combined by the multiplexer to produce one composite signal which is shown right at the end this zigzag signal that you see this is the composite signal which is obtained after multiplexing now what will happen at the receiving end at the receiving end this composite signal will be given to three filters why three filters see 
in multiplexing you have three baseband signals that means they are coming from three input devices so logically you will have three output devices so for each output device you need a filter as well as a demodulator what you do is you take this composite signal which is produced by the multiplexer and you give it to all these filters you give it to three filters one filter is allocated for one output device or one receiving device so what will the filter do the filter will decompose the multiplex signal this is the composite multiplex signal that you see this zigzag wave so it will decompose the multiplexed signal into its constituent component signals as you can see after undergoing filtration the constituent component signals have been generated now these constituent component signals will go through a demodulator what will the demodulator do the demodulator will simply take out the carrier frequency and generate the original baseband analog signals so this signal which comes out from the filter each of these filtered signals that you see here they are fed to the demodulators now these demodulators again will use the same carrier frequency as you can see the modulator which used a carrier frequency f1 will have a demodulator at the receiving end using the same carrier frequency f1 because you need to know this carrier frequency in order to separate out the original baseband analog signal so you take the carrier frequency f1 you give it to the demodulator the demodulator takes out the original baseband analog signal and gives it to the output device or gives it to the receiving unit in this way you are able to carry out the transmission using multiplexing and demultiplexing remember multiplexing takes place at the sending end and demultiplexing takes place at the receiving end now let's take an example see the question you can probably read it out for yourself that a voice channel has been given and it occupies a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz what we need to do is we need to combine three such voice channels into a link with a bandwidth of 12 kilohertz and this bandwidth ranges between 20 and 32 kilohertz so we have been asked to show the configuration using fdm assuming that there are no guard bands used so we have so i'll just try to sum up this question for you we have three voice channels each voice channel has a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz now what we want to do is we need, we want to take these three voice channels and pass it through one link or through one transmission medium which has a bandwidth of 12 kilohertz now the range of this bandwidth 12 kilohertz has also been given to be 20 to 32 kilohertz we have been asked to show the configuration using frequency division multiplexing assuming that no guard bands have been used now let's look at this diagram see okay one thing that i need to mention here is one acknowledgement that i need to do is that all these diagrams have been taken from the book of farausen what you can do is you can refer to that book it's a complete book it's like a story it's a beautiful book you must go through it in order to understand multiplexing in detail see i'm trying to explain the things as well as i possibly can but in addition to that what you should do is after going through this video you should take up the book on farausen and you should revise these topics as well then it will be much more clear to you it's a beautiful book and i have taken all these images from the book of farausen okay now coming back see i have how many voice channels do i have i have three voice channels see it has been mentioned that we need to combine three voice channels so each voice channel has a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz now see each voice channel is noted by this telephone receiver that you can see there is a telephone see there is a telephone here three telephones in the picture now each telephone device is generating an analog signal is generating a voice channel voice signal right see a voice channel occupies a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz so each of these telephones is generating a voice signal now the bandwidth of each of these signals is 4 kilohertz as you can see here the output from the telephones is a signal having a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz and the range is 0 to 4 now what you do is you take each of these signals and you give it to a modulator what will the modulator do the modulator like we saw here see what will the modulator do the modulator will use a carrier frequency and it will modulate your original signal so here the first modulator modulates the original signal into a some i would say i would i wouldn't say a combined signal it modulates into a modulated signal the modulated signal also has a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz but see the range has changed the range was initially 0 to 4 now it has changed from now it has changed to 
20 to 24. The second modulator again takes the original signal, which has a bandwidth of 0 to 4, and modulates it to a signal having a range of 24 to 28. The third modulator modulates it to 20 to 32. How is it able to define three different ranges? It is able to define three different ranges because it has different carrier frequencies. The first modulator has a different carrier frequency. The second modulator has a different carrier frequency and the third modulator has a different carrier frequency. Because of the different carrier frequencies used by the modulators, you get different modulated signals. And why am I saying these modulated signals are different? They are different because you can see the ranges. The first modulated signal has a range of 20 to 24. The second modulated signal has a range of 24 to 28. And the third modulated signal has a range of 28 to 32. Now what do you do? You combine these modulated signals into a multiplexer. You combine these modulated signals into a multiplexer. Now after combining it into a multiplexer, what will you get? You will get a composite signal whose range is from 20 to 32. Why 20? Because you can see out of the three modulated signals you get, the lowest range is that of 20 and the highest range is that of 32. So the composite signal that you will get will have a lower bound of 20 and a higher bound of 32. Now you take this composite signal and you transmit it through a high bandwidth link. This high bandwidth link has a bandwidth of 12 kilohertz as has been mentioned in the question. Now you transmit this composite signal through the higher bandwidth link and now at the receiving end what will it happen? It will go through filters. Now here we have mentioned the filter. We have used a bandpass filter. See what a bandpass filter is is beyond the scope of our course. So I'll leave it at that. Just remember that this filter what will it do is it will separate out. It will take the composite signal. Each of these filters will accept the composite signal and will filter them out into their constituent component signals. So if you remember from the multiplexing part, see here from the multiplexing part, the first component signal has a range of 20 to 24. So the first bandpass filter will filter out only the frequencies 20 to 24 to generate this signal. The second bandpass filter will filter out only those frequencies between 24 to 28. And the third bandpass filter will filter out only those frequencies between 28 and 32. Now after this is done, what will happen? See, if you look at this diagram, see after the filter, what do you do? You pass it through a demodulator. Although it has not been shown in this diagram, 20 to 24, 24 to 28 and 28 to 32, as you can see in the receiving end, each of these signals will then be made to pass through demodulators, respective demodulators. Now the first signal, which has a range of 20 to 24, will pass through a demodulator and the demodulator using another carrier frequency will take out the original signal and its bandwidth will range from 0 to 4 like it was in the input. See here also 24 to 28 passes through a demodulator using a carrier frequency. See here the demodulator uses a carrier frequency. Each of the demodulators will use carrier frequencies which will have a frequency same as used in the modulator. So here also you will have demodulators which have which has not been shown the demodulators will have the same frequency as used in the modulators which frequency am i talking about i'm talking about the carrier frequency so the carrier frequency will be used to separate out the original signals and the range will be same as that of the signals generated so the signal that was generated here was 0 to 4 here also it's been changed to 0 to 4 from 20 to 24 you pass it through the demodulator and you get 0 to 4. From 24 to 28, you pass it through the demodulator, you get 0 to 4. Again, 20 to 32, you pass it through the demodulator and you get 0 to 4. Now let's take an example. See, this is a numerical. So you have been given a voice channel which occupies a bandwidth of 4 kilohertz. You need to multiplex 10 such voice channels into a link. Now the difference with the previous question is here guard bands have been spoken about. So guard bands are those strips of bandwidths which are used to separate the constituent signals so that they do not overlap. Now we have been asked to calculate the required bandwidth of the link. So here each of these blue boxes which contain the number four, they denote each of the voice channels. So how many voice channels you need? You need 10. So if you can count, there are 10 blue boxes here. Now what I need to do is I need to separate each of these blue boxes which in effect denote a voice channel. I need to separate each of these voice channels denoted by each blue box by guard bands. Now, what is the 
frequency of guard bands used? The frequency is 500 hertz. So that's why these arrows that you see pointing downwards, these arrows denote the guard bands. So between every pair of voice channel, I need to have a guard band in order to prevent overlap. So how many, if I have, if I have 10 voice channels, how many guard bands do I need? I need always one less than the number of voice channels. If you can count the number of arrows, you will see that there are nine guard bands used. So number of voice channels, as it has been mentioned in the question is 10. Now frequency of each voice channel is 4000 Hertz. So the total frequency required for voice channels will be, you take one voice channel, the frequency of one voice channel, and you multiply it by the number of voice channels to get 40,000 Hertz. And how many guard bands are you using to prevent signal overlap? which are shown by the arrows, you are using nine guard bands. Now each of these guard bands require a bandwidth of 500 Hertz for a total of 4,500 Hertz. So the required bandwidth will be the total frequency required by the voice channels and the total frequency required by the guard bands. So it comes out to be 44,500 Hertz. So I hope this numerical is clear to me. Now what are some of the applications of FDM? FDM is used in AM and FM radio broadcasting. It is also used in television broadcasting and also in certain first generations cellular telephones. And what about the implementation? The implementation of FDM is simple. You know, you don't need a physical multiplexer or demultiplexer. Why do you do not need a physical multiplexer or demultiplexer? Because in most cases, air will be used for transmission. If you see FM or your AM or your television broadcasting, they'll be using air for the transmission process. As a result, they can coordinate among themselves to use different frequencies as a result, there will be no overlap and you do not need a multiplexer or a demultiplexer. And the base station, remember, needs to assign a carrier frequency to the telephone user so that, as you saw, why do you need the carrier frequency? You need the carrier frequency so that modulation can take place and your original signal, which is generally of a lower frequency, can be converted to, into a higher frequency signal, which can be transmitted over long ranges. So I guess FDM is clear. Now I'll move on to WDM. So WDM refers to wavelength division multiplexing, which is essentially designed for optical fiber cable. Remember that. So WDM is designed to use the high data rate capability of fiber optic cable. The optical fiber data rate, remember, is higher than the data rate of metallic transmission cable. It's the best wired transmission medium that we have, optical fiber cables using fiber optic cables for one single line wastes the available bandwidth. Like I mentioned right at the beginning of the video, I took the example of optical fiber. I told you that if you're going to use optical fiber to carry out transmission between a single sender and a single receiver, you will in effect be wasting a lot of bandwidth. So what you do is you multiplex. So using fiber optic cable for one single line wastes the available bandwidth. Multiplexing allows us to combine several lines into one. Now WDM is conceptually same as frequency division multiplexing, which we saw just a while ago, except that the multiplexing and demultiplexing involves optical signals through fiber optic channels. The, the idea is the same. We are combining different signals of different frequencies. The only difference is that in this cases, when you're using optical fibers, your frequencies are very high. And WDM is also an analog multiplexing technique which is used to combine optical signals. Although WDM technology is very complex, the basic idea is very simple. We combine multiple light sources into one single light, and this is done at the multiplexer, and we do the reverse at the demultiplexer. And remember, combining and splitting of light sources are handled using a prism, like we will see shortly. Now see, this is the conceptual view of a WDM multiplexer and a demultiplexer. See, very narrow bands of light are combined from different sources having different wavelengths, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, to make a wider band of light, which has a wavelength of the summation of the individual wavelengths. And at the receiver, the signals are separated by the demultiplexer. Now here, you see a prism bends a beam of light based on your angle of incidence and frequency. We know this from basic physics that a prism will bend a beam of light based on the angle of incidence and the frequency. Now using this technique, a mux can be made to combine several input beams of light. Like you can see in the figure, we are combining three input beams of light denoted by wavelengths lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3 respectively. 
and each contains a narrow band of frequencies. We combine each of these signals into one output beam of a wider band of frequencies. So here, these three signals having respective wavelengths of lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3 go through a multiplexer. They are combined and here they go through a fiber optic cable. The fiber optic cable allows to transmit the wider band of frequencies obtained by summing up the individual wavelengths. A demultiplexer, what it does is it does the exact reverse thing of the multiplexer. It takes the composite signal and it separates it out into the individual signals denoted by wavelengths lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3 respectively. That was all about wavelength division multiplexing. Now we move on to time division multiplexing. See, in time division multiplexing, what happens is you need to keep in mind that it is a digital multiplexing technique. Time division multiplexing technique is a digital multiplexing technique. And also remember, instead of sharing a portion of the bandwidth, like we saw in FDM, what, what were we doing in FDM? In frequency division multiplexing, we were sharing a portion of the bandwidth. In time division multiplexing, we will be sharing time. And each connection will occupy a portion of the time in the link, like we'll see shortly. And remember, TDM is mainly of two types, synchronous time division multiplexing and statistical time division multiplexing. Moving on, see, this is the conceptual flow or the conceptual view of TDM. The same link is used as an FDM. Here, however, the link is shown sectioned by time rather than by bandwidth. In the figure, portions of signals 1, 2, 3, and 4 occupy the link sequentially. We need to remember that TDM is a digital multiplexing technique, of course, and digital data from different sources are combined into one time shared link. Analog data can also be transmitted by first changing it to digital data and then multiplexing using TDM. So here you have four stations at each end. So here you have four input stations and these are the four stations, four receiving stations waiting for the signals from the input stations. Here, each signal that is generated from each of these devices, one, two, three, and four, is combined by the multiplexer. And now what you do is, you do not do it with respect to the bandwidth, you do it with respect to time. So portions of the signals, one, two, three, and four, occupy the link sequentially. So first you have station one transmitting, then station two, then station three, and then station four. This happens in a round robin fashion. As you can see, here you have, first you have station one transmitting, then station two, then station three, then station four, then again back to station one, station two, station three, station four, again back to station one, station two, station three, and station four. So this happens in a round robin fashion. So you first do station one, then station two, then station three, then station four, and you again go back to station one. So in this way, what you do is you divide your time slots and you allot one slot for each of these devices. Now this is the diagram of synchronous time division multiplexing. As you can see that I have, a, I have three input lines. One input line is for transmission of the frame A or the data from line A Another is for the data from line B. Another is for the data from line C. What you do is you take the data coming from line A and you divide it into three slots. Now each slot has a duration of T time units. Okay, so data are taken from each line after every T seconds. Now you divide it into A1, A2, A3. Similarly, you divide it into B1, B2, B3 and C1, C2, C3 respectively for lines two and three. Now what you do is you apply round robin technique. So first, you will transmit A1. So that goes and sits into one slot of frame one. Then you will transmit B1. That goes and sits in another slot of frame one. And then you transmit C1. That goes and sits in another slot of frame one. After that, you again go back to A2. So you're doing A, B, C. And then again, you're going back to A. So you're going to A2, B2, and C2. So A2, B2, C2, each occupies one slot in a frame. Then again, you do the same for A3, B3, and C3. So what you can see is each frame has three time slots and each time slot duration is T by three seconds. That means it has a shorter duration. See here each slot was of T seconds duration. We have seen here that data are taken from each line every T seconds. But we, what we can see here is in the output frames, each slot 
appears every t by three seconds. So that means the frame, the frame slots that we have, each slot duration is a lot lesser than the input slot. Now, why this three? Where does this three come from? This three denotes the number of input lines that you have. That means if I, here I have three lines, so each frame time slot duration. See, each frame is three time slots because you have three input lines. And what about the time slot duration? The time slot duration is t by three. Again, why the three? Because you have three input lines. So here in place of three, if you had n input lines, then each frame would have n input time slots and each time slot duration would have been t by n. Now, these are some very important points that you need to keep in mind for, for solving numericals on time division multiplexing. So if an input time slot is t seconds, like I mentioned, the output time slot will be t by n seconds, where n is the number of input connections to the multiplexer. That means the unit in the output connection, which is a frame. So one unit in the output connection refers to one slot in the frame. As you can see, one slot in the frame has a duration of t by three, whereas one slot in the input had a duration of t. That means it's a lot faster, right? The out unit in the output connection has a shorter duration and therefore it travels a lot faster. Now, if you have n connections, a frame will be divided into n time slots. So here, how many connections do we have? Here we have three connections. That's why we divide every frame into three slots. As you can see, frame one has three slots, frame two has three slots, and frame three has three slots. Had you increased the number of input lines, then the number of slots in your frames would also increase. And remember, the duration of each input unit is same as the duration of each frame. And it is the inverse of the bit rate. So if you're given a bit rate of, let's say one kbps, then what would be the duration of each in input unit? The duration of each input unit will be one divided by one kbps. So here each input unit, see this is each in input unit denoted by capital T. So A1 is occupying one input unit, A2 is occupying one input unit, C3 is occupying one input unit, so each input unit, the duration of each input unit is duration of each frame. Look at the frame. See frame one has a duration of T and each input unit, A1, A2, B2, C3, they have an input duration of T. So we can conclude that each input duration is same as each frame duration. And this is found by taking the inverse of the bit rate. And duration of each slot in the frame is T by N, like I mentioned, where N is the number of input lines. What about the data rate of the output link? The data rate of the output link will be n times the data rate of an input line. That means here we have, let's say if you have a data rate of the input line, see all input lines are assumed to have the same data rate. All input lines are assumed to have the same data rate. If one input line has a data rate of one kbps, then the output link will have a data rate of n into the data rate of an input line. That means if the data rate of the input line is one kbps and if we have three input lines, then the data rate of the output link will be three into one kbps. That is three kbps. Now duration of a unit on an input line will be n times the duration of an input or duration of a unit on the link. See duration of a unit on an input line. Duration of a unit on an input line is this duration denoted by T for A1, B2, C2 and the duration of a unit on the link refers to this duration, this T by three. This T by three refers to a duration of a unit on the link. On the link means on the out, outgoing link, this transmission medium, this arrow that you see extending from the multiplexer, this refers to the transmission link. So the duration on, of a unit, a unit on the output link will have a duration of n times, will have a duration of n times the duration on an input line and number of slots in a frame will obviously depend on the number of input lines and time slots are grouped into frames where a frame will consist of one complete cycle of time slots obtained by round robin technique. So I'll just, uh, I don't know why, but I feel that point number six needs to be explained once more. If you have understood, you can, you can skip this part. I'll just explain point number six once again. See duration of an input on an input line. This duration refers to the time period P. That means the time occupied by A1, B2, C1, C3 and others. Duration of a unit on the link refers to the slot occupied in a frame. Look at the time duration of a slot on the frame. See time duration of a slot in a frame is P by three. And here 
the time duration is t that means it's the time duration the time duration of an input line is three times the duration of a unit on the link so here n in this in this example what is the value of n here you have three input lines so the value of n is 3 now if you multiply 3 into if you multiply t by 3 by 3 or let's say if you multiply 3 into t by 3 what you get is t itself which is same as the duration of an input slot so this is what i wanted to explain now what is interleaving see this is a very simple diagram here you have two circular uh, patterns or two circular rings which denote switches now these switches one switch is connected to the multiplexer and the other switch is connected to the demultiplexer mind you both of these switches are synchronized and one switch will rotate in clockwise direction and the other switch will rotate in the anti clockwise direction what happens is as the switches rotate one frame at a time will be built up that means one slot see this interleaving diagram that you see is for this figure is for this figure now for this figure as you can see that first you will have a1 b1 c1 going inside a frame and then you will have a2 b2 c2 same is shown for this interleaving so first what happens is as this switch rotates the switch which is at the multiplexing end the switch at the left end of your screen this switch as it will rotate it will take a1 put it in a frame b1 put it in the same frame and c1 put it in a frame and give it to the output so in this way the frames are built up one after the other and they and this process needs to be synchronized otherwise there will be a haphazard scenario where one frame which is destined for one particular output device may end up reaching another output device what about why why can we have empty slots see this is one disadvantage of synchronous time division multiplexing here the slots the frame slots are fixed and they depend on the number of input lines you have the example that you can see here there are how many input lines there are three input lines you have the first input line containing how many frames in fact if you observe carefully there are four input lines i'm sorry there are four input lines so what should be the size of each frame each frame should contain four slots now as you can see that the second input line is completely empty in spite of being empty you need to allocate slots in the output frame so this is a disadvantage of synchronous time division multiplexing where you waste bandwidth for allocating input lines which do not have any data to send see the first input line is sending how many uh, packets or how many input units three input units the second line is not sending any unit at all but still i am allocating a slot in the frame for it the third input line is sending two and the fourth input line is sending three so each frame will contain four slots but as you can see for the first frame for the first frame you will get one slot from the first line the second slot will be empty that's why it's empty here and then the third slot gets another slot in the frame the third input slot gets a slot in the frame and the fourth input slot coming from the fourth input line gets a slot in the frame so in this way for the second round you will have one input unit going into one frame again the second line is empty so this will remain empty empty the third input line also is empty so here you have two empty slots so here you have two empty slots and then again for the fourth line the second input is present so you have another input here so in this way empty slots will end up wasting bandwidth now what about uh, this problems solution see data rate management in data rate management what happens is there will be disparity in data input rates right see in the previous examples in these diagrams we assume that there are three input lines now each of these input lines are transmitting at the same data rate but it will not happen that way all the time in real life scenario it's not possible or it's not always you know possible and i would say it's not always feasible for all input lines to transmit at the same data rate this is what you mean by disparity in, in data input rates so if there is disparity in data input rates you need to come up with data rate management techniques in order to go ahead with synchronous time division multiplexing so if data rates are not same you will go for there are three strategies you can adopt any one of them the first one is multi level multiplexing look at this here how many input lines do i have i have 1 2 3 4 5 input lines the first two input lines have a data rate of 20 kbps each and the last three input lines have a data rate of 40 kbps each 
Now, each of these input lines, they do not have the same data rate. Now, there is a disparity. So what we can do is we can employ multi-level multiplexing where we will take the first two input lines and we'll multiplex them to form a resultant signal or a resultant data rate, which is same as the remaining three input lines. As a result, we are able to achieve a consistency and then we can go ahead with the multiplexing process. So this is one solution to the disparity in data input rates. Another solution is multiple slot allocation. It may so happen that here you can see that one input line is 50 kbps, whereas the remaining three are 25 kbps each. So what you do is for this 50 kbps line, you allocate two slots in the output frame. So in the output frame, how many slots would you have? You would have four slots. Why? Because there are four input lines, but there is an exception here. The first input line is not a multiple of the remaining three. So what you do is you divide it into the constituent signals such that it can be same as the remaining three lines. See now all after the division of 50 kbps into 25 kbps each, you have all five lines with 25 kbps. So how is this possible? This division of 50 kbps into 25 kbps each will be possible only when you allocate two slots for your 50 kbps input line. So this is one solution that you can come up with to manage disparity in data input rates. And the third solution is pulse stuffing. So what is pulse stuffing? See here you have three input lines. The first two input lines are 50 kbps each. The third input line is 46 kbps. So you apply pulse stuffing. That means you insert four kbps worth of dummy bits to make it to make the third input line also of 50 kbps. In this way, three input lines, all of them will be of 50 kbps. And then you can go ahead with the multiplexing process. Now, what about frame synchronization? It is important to synchronize the frames because what happens is if you do not carry out any synchronization, then a particular frame, like I mentioned, one frame, which is destined for one particular output device may end up going into another device. So in order to ensure synchronization, what we do is we add alternating bits of ones and zero. That means for frame one, if I add one, then for frame two, I'll add zero. Then for frame three, I'll add one. If I have a frame four, I'll again add zero. Then for frame five, I'll add one. In this way, I'll keep on adding alternating zeros and ones to ensure synchronization. These synchronization bits are very important to ensure that data reaches the intended recipient. And the next time division multiplexing technique is statistical time division multiplexing. Here, what you do is you dynamically allocate slots. See, in the previous case, like you saw, in statistical time division multiplexing. See, sorry, in synchronous time division multiplexing, what happened was, I'll take you to the example on empty slots. Yeah, see, here you are bound to allocate slots for every input line, even if that input line does not have any data rate or does not have any data to transmit, not data rate, pardon me. If and even if an input line does not have any data to transmit, you need to allocate slots for it in the output frames. What statistical time division multiplexing does is it overcomes this inefficiency by allocating slots dynamically. Now here what happens is, as you can see that I have how many lines? I have five lines denoted by A to E. Now the first line has only one packet to transmit, which is A1. So I'll keep that in my out, outgoing frame. I'll keep B1 in my outgoing frame, but before keeping B1, I need to keep the address of the intended recipient. That means line A, which is generating a input unit A1 needs to transmit this to a particular receiving device. Now, since I am allocating slots dynamically, I need to mention the destination address of this input unit, which is generated by line A. I need to do that for the other lines as well. For line B also, as you can see, I've written B1, which is the input unit. And along with that, I've written B. Here, small b refers to the destination address of B1. Similarly, line C does not have any input transition transmission. So no slot is allocated in the output frame. Line D has a transmission of D1. So I'll have D1 here and I'll also write the destination address to be D. So and again, see line E does not have anything to transmit in the first round. This is the first round, right? A1, B1, C has nothing, then D1 and then E1. If C had something to transmit, it would have been C1. So you would have A1, B1, C1, D1, E1. If all the lines were transmitting, then your frame would have been complete. But since some lines like C and E are not transmitting in the first round, 
they will not be allocated slots in the output frame. Same is with done with round two. With round two of transmission, you can see that line A is not transmitting, so no slot is allocated for it. Line B is again transmitting, so first you will start with line B. The line B unit is B2, the input unit is B2, and its intended destination is B. And then again, line C is not transmitting, so no slot for it. Line D is transmitting D2, so there is a slot for D2 along with the destination address small d. And again, line E is transmitting this time in the second round. It is transmitting E2 and it has a destination of address of small e. So this is how statistical time division multiplexing improves the inefficiency of synchronous time division multiplexing. So it employs addressing in this way. It includes not only the input unit in the frame, but also allocates the address of the destination device. And remember, the slot size will now vary, right? The slot size will be such that it will vary. And one more thing, in this case, since you are specifying the destination address for each frame slot, you do not need any synchronization width. What happened previously was in synchronous time division multiplexing, you needed a synchronization bit because you were not specifying the destination address. So using the synchron synchronization bit, the receiving devices would be able to make out which packet is intended for it because it is run in a round robin fashion. But in statistical time division multiplexing, since I'm specifying the destination address, I have no need of any synchronization. And the last point is bandwidth. So remember in statistical time division multiplexing, the capacity of the link is normally less than the sum of the capacities of each channel. This is a very important point you should know. The designers of statistical time division multiplexing define the capacity of the link, which is based on the statistics of the load for each channel. So this is how the statistical time division multiplexing capacity is defined. Okay, it's done experimentally. It's nothing is known in advance. So I hope uh, this helps you to understand multiplexing. I have explained the entire topic. What I'll be doing is I'll be sharing this PowerPoint presentation with you in the description section below. If you have any doubts, please feel free to comment in the section given below. I hope you understood and benefited from this video. Thank you.